Thanks a lot for inviting me over and uh, thanks everybody for coming. It's always exciting to be back here. Um, yeah, and it's fun. This is the NVIDIA auditorium. Great match. Because <laughs> I'm mostly going to talk about stuff that we've actually done uh, at the NVIDIA lab over the last years. Um, just a quick background. I uh, started two and a half years ago, first with an 80% position at NVIDIA, starting a robotics lab. And now I'm currently on a half half and half position with the university, so back, back to teaching as well. And uh, this all came about when I had a meeting with, with Jensen Wang, the CEO of NVIDIA, talking about robotics and um, what are the, the hot areas where uh, this new kind of robotics really has an impact on industrial settings. And what's of course already happening right now is really robots in warehouses moving around, navigating through hospitals, hotels, um, of course self-driving cars. Uh, is, is the big elephant in the room always. Um, but what we wanted to look at in the research side is really robots that are not just about navigating around, but robots that um, physically interact with their environment. So if you imagine self-driving cars, of course, the main focus is not to physically interact with your environment, maybe with the tires, but otherwise you don't want to crash into anything. Um, so if you want to have a look at these kind of robots, then it's really about interacting with the environment, touching things, um, doing this in close proximity to people around you. And application domains of these kind of robots is of course um, uh, industrial manufacturing and you've heard some uh, recent exciting news about where these kind of deep learning technologies for example are having an impact on manipulation settings in industry but also people with physical disabilities, a colleague at Georgia Tech, Charlie Kemp, is investigating, for example, how robots can help people with physical disabilities, here in the case even where the robot might help shaving the person or pulling up a blanket when the person is lying in the bed. So you can imagine that in these cases the robot really has to kind of be in contact with a person and all of this has to be safe, but at the same time the robot has to have kind of the perception capabilities to reason about what is going on around it, right? And in general, pe helping people, um, uh, elderly people in hospitals. So this is kind of the goal for this kind of work. And we realized, of course, there's still a lot of research to be done in order to do this. So we started the robotics lab in Seattle uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, we're currently 12 research scientists. Uh, we have over the summer, for example, we had 20 interns last year. Several of them are here in the room from Stanford. It was uh, really fun working with, with all these smart people. Um, what I want to talk about today, though, is one project uh, that we started in the lab, and that is about um, uh, getting a robot to do certain tasks in a kitchen. And we're clearly not doing cooking yet, but uh, we chose kitchen kind of as an integrated test environment, right, in which we can uh, look at different aspects of this manipulation problem or puzzle, right? Um, this is uh, the kitchen we have, it's an IKEA kitchen, just bought down the road. We also have a simulation model of that. And the idea for the kitchen is really that, again, we can uh, integrate different manipulation components into it. We can do task planning, motion planning, and things like that. But also you can make it, in a staged way, more and more complex, right? So initially, actually, as you'll see today, it's mostly very simple tasks, like just pick up an object and move it somewhere. But then on the longer run, you can make it more and more complicated by introducing people into the kitchen. So the robot has to start interacting with them, has to understand what the uh, person wants to do, and maybe help the person cooking, and even maybe helping with preparing ingredients or cooking ultimately itself. But um, the idea is that many of these tasks really just stand in for many of these other application domains you could imagine, for example, also in industrial manufacturing. Um, the specific thing we wanted to look at initially is really that um, let's assume we have a, this kitchen here and um, we make the very strong assumption that we have a 3D model of the kitchen which means we know where the drawers are, we know where the doors are and we even have 3D models of the objects. You might have seen the famous spam can is kind of from the YCB object data set. I'm kind of getting tired of it but just looking at it, not even eating. I haven't eaten any of them. Um, but also, yeah, the cheese it box, these kind of objects. So the idea was, under these super strong assumptions, uh, can we build a system that can do, let's say, reasonably simple pick and place tasks, like just opening a drawer and getting an object out of, out of it. Um, on the perception side, uh, we use actually, in this case, just because we didn't 
from it to put actually a depth camera on the robot itself. We have like two depth cameras uh, looking at the kitchen and then the idea is use them to, to track what's going on in there. Okay. Uh, the robot basis is the Carter that is uh, used by NVIDIA by the Isaac SDK team that is focusing so for more on uh, navigation system building a navigation stack also with very strong support of course for deep learning and GPU processing and we put a Franca arm on top and for some of the more recent work also we could we put a depth camera onto the wrist of the the robot so that you can get closer up if you want to pick up objects. So if you think about what's involved in such a manipulation task then on the high level you have this what people call task and motion planning. So a, a subpart of the robotics community is focusing on this where you say you know where objects are for example in the world you have uh, geometric models of everything and then you want to for example let's say if you want to say set the table then you say the target configuration is that the plate and the fork and knife are on the table and then you have a high level let's say more logic planning based descriptions on where you say well for the table for example if the table is in the drawer in order for the robot to be able to pick up uh, the plate not not the table if the plate is in the drawer for the robot to get uh, the plate out of the drawer, the drawer has to be opened and things like that. So you have preconditions on actions and then you can chain these and can come up with a plan that achieves a desired configuration. Okay, this is task and motion planning and um, what you do jointly with this um, high level planning is also the actual motion planning for the robot so that it can achieve these tasks. And the other thing, of course, if you want to execute that in the real world, you need state estimation. You need to know actually what is the status of the world where the objects are. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more. Then you need to be able to grasp and place objects. And again, here we're taking advantage of the fact that we have 3D models of objects. And we can more or less pre-specify uh, all these different components. And then the, the final ingredient is then on the manipulator itself, you need a controller that actually executes all these planned motions. Okay? So in this talk, I just want to go through some of these, um, uh, these areas and give you an example for the kind of work we've done in, in that. And then later I'll give um, one more example on um, how we expand the grasping to unknown objects. Okay, so the first part is we've done a lot of work on 60 object pose estimation. And I know there's uh, some really cool and exciting work, of course, going on here as well. So we're kind of working ourselves alongside uh, to this problem. And the idea is, of course, if you have an object and you want to manipulate it, let's say this is our famous Cheez-It box, and you have a 3D model of the object, and you want the robot, for example, to pick it up, then um, one approach is that you want to estimate where it is relative to the robot. Okay, so the task is you get an image and the object is in the image and you want to know, for example, in that specific image, what is the 3D position and 3D orientation of the object. That's why it's a 6D estimation problem. Okay, so it's orientation and translation. And there's, of course, a lot of work has been going on in the computer vision community, especially it's been focusing on this problem for quite a while. There's many standard data sets on how to evaluate your technique. A lot of the focus has actually been on kind of single image estimation, which means you get a single image of the scene and then you immediately go to an estimate for the 60 pose of the object. Um, and again, a lot of really cool work coming out of, out of Stanford here. Um, and the typical approach most recently has also been, for example, on just regressing more or less the image to a 60 pose estimate, right, using deep learning and using um, large-scale uh, training data sets. Uh, th the focus of these is also that you really want to regress the pose estimate to a unique pose of the robot. And it turns out if you have symmetric objects, then the question is whether that even makes sense, whether there, whether there is a uniquely defined 6D pose. And I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide a bit more. Um, and then there's other work on tracking, but again, there it's also just kind of a unimodal estimate, Kalman filter style. And there's one exception where they used a particle filter, but it turns out that if you just use a standard particle filter for sampling this full 60 space, then it also boils down more or less to just being able to do tracking because the 60 post space of these objects is pretty complicated as um, I'll show you next. So what we wanted to focus on is really estimating now the full 60 pose distribution and uncertainty um, and doing that even for symmetric objects, okay? So why is um, orientation uncertainty actually not as simple as you might think? Uh, let's imagine this is an object like uh, tuna can, I think. 
in this case. And this is the only um, observation you get. Right? So now the question is, what is the orientation of the, of the object? Or, sim or the, the uh, equivalent question is, what is the camera viewpoint onto that object given that image? Okay? And it turns out, of course, that you have quite some uncertainty in the orientation that you cannot resolve based on that single image because you could be anywhere, the camera could be anywhere around the object, right? Or it could even be, in this case, if it's symmetric, you could kind of view the object from the bottom part. Now you might say that that is just because people are using depth cameras and they don't know how to use uh, texture and visual information. So if you now use a textured model of the object and you also use color, then um, you m might be able to actually resolve that uncertainty and you have kind of a unimodal distribution of where you are relative to the object. Does that make sense? Okay, so on the one hand side, of course, color helps you resolve some uncertainties, but then even in this case, even if you have that object model, if you're looking at some point at the object from the top, then even in this situation, you still don't know where you are relative to it, even if you use, if you have a textured object, right? So um, to summarize this part, it's really that on the one hand side, the symmetries result in pretty complex actually distributions. And you cannot predefine actually the shape of these distributions in advance because it often depends on your specific viewpoint and it depends on certain occlusions you have in the scene. Right? You might have specific uncertainties just because uh, a specific part of an object is occluded and because of that you can't resolve it. So what we wanted to do is we want to do 60-pose um, estimation where we keep track of these full distributions here. Uh, the first approach here is, and that is actually borrowing the idea of, of Sundermeyer and, and colleagues. They had, that was actually best paper at ECCV in 2018. Um, and they kind of, their focus was specifically on orientation uncertainty over um, objects. Okay, I just want to give you a brief summary on how that works. Imagine you have this object and what they are learning is kind of a, a, um, a code book for certain views onto this object. So the idea is that you have an autoencoder and you train this with pairs of input images and output images. Okay, so the goal of the autoencoder is to take a noisy image of the object, a view onto the object from a, let's say, normalized distance to the object and it has to learn to encode this, in this case into a 128 dimensional code word, for such that you can decode it into a clean image of the object. Okay? And you do this with many pairs, right, different viewpoints, and in a sense what the network learns is to kind of take input on a noisy image and encode it such that it can specifically also recover the viewpoint onto the object. I hope that makes sense. And again, you do this for many pairs. And once it's trained, you can now go and in their case, you just can generate 92,000 something views, different viewpoints onto the object. And for each viewpoint, you just store the code that the encoder generates for that view. Okay? And now during testing, if someone gives you an image of the object, you throw away the decoder because actually you don't need that. You encode that and then what you do is you just compare the code word with your code book using just a cosine similarity measure and that similarity tells you which view from which view you're looking at the object. Yeah? And then what they did in their work, they just chose the most similar one and said like, okay, that is the orientation of the object. Okay? The nice thing is if you have, let's say, a symmetric object like this one, that all the, if you look at it from here, that it will match very well every view that is around this object that has the same, that looks the same, right? So it very naturally recovers or encodes this notion of that objects might look the same from different orientations. Okay, the, similar, uh, the, the um, limitations of that work is that um, if they only really cared about getting a single orientation out of it and they didn't worry about different translations of the objects. 
and also it was just a single image and a single estimate. But this is kind of the foundation for what we did then where we said we want to incorporate that into a full 60 post tracking framework. And for that we developed this technique called post RBPF. Um, RBPF stands for raw black rice particle filtering so we thought we we're going to bring in some good old particle filtering in, into here where the idea of particle filtering is you, you um, represent densities or uncertainties uh, by samples um, uh, that represent then the, the high density areas by having uh, more samples in that area. Um, and the idea of these specific raw black realized particle filters is, is just rather than saying for example I'm going to sample this full 60 post space, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample certain parts of the state space and others I'm going to solve analytically conditioned on the samples. Okay, people have used this in different contexts like activity recognition. You might have heard here from Stanford, Sebastian, Thron, Daphne Koller, they introduced fast slam where what they, they decoupled the slam problem by sampling trajectories of the robot and for each sample trajectory they would then build a map. Right, so now you have a sample based representation that encapsulates both uncertainty of the path and uncertainty of the map that corresponds to that. In our case, we use the same idea, but here what we say is we're going to sample the translation of the object, which is XYZ, and we're going to solve for the orientation using just a discrete uh, distribution. So here's how this works. Uh, each particle now has a translation, again XYZ, where is the object? and a full distribution over the rotation conditioned on the translation of that object. Okay, so what that means is we first can take an image like this one here and if we have a particle that has a specific translation that will give us a specific bounding box for the object in the image. If the translation says that the object is further away then the bounding box will be smaller for example and things like that, right? And it moves throughout the image and then we can feed this region of interest that corresponds to that single particle. We can encode it and compare it to the same code book that uh, you saw by the Sundermeyer work. In our case we have even more bins for the orientation, yeah, 191,000, which means 191,000 orientations, okay? And then that gives you the likelihood and that likelihood is what you use to um, weight your particles and then you do over time, you can do the resampling and, and very standard particle filter techniques, right? There's nothing special about it. The only insight was here really to say um, we do the seemingly crazy thing of having every particle with like these almost 200,000 bins that represent the possible orientations and we can do this of course efficiently because we only need to compute the code once per particle and then the comparison with the code book that's of course on a GPU you can do this all in parallel. So that's why we can do all of this then in real time. Okay, let me just show you an example. On the right side you see the particle, the kind of the uh, orientation uncertainty. And these are the different bounding boxes of the different particles. Okay, and What's interesting here is that initially when um, the handle of the mug, let me play this again, when the handle of the mug is not uh, visible, the uncertainty is actually much larger in the orientation, right, because you don't know where it is exactly. But then when the handle comes into view, the uncertainty really goes um, down significantly. Okay, so it really nicely handles all these kind of different viewpoints. Another thing of course you can do now is even though this is kind of a technique that is only based on kind of this, let's say, local region of, Im uh, of interest images, you can just do global localization, which means you can do detection with this technique as well, where what you do is you just randomly throw out, I don't know how many, 5,000 particles. This is, these are the bounding boxes of these 5,000 particles, and because we don't need to sample the orientation, we do it analytically again through this full distribution. It very quickly actually converges then to the right pose and then we can even reduce the number of particles and then track the object through time. Okay, and again this can be done pretty fast so with at the end the tracking 50 particles was 20 frames per second and now I think um, Xinke, this was done, Xinke did this as an intern 
um, he has it to more than 30 frames per second, actually, the tracking. OK? So now what we have is we can estimate the poses of these individual objects. But of course, in this, let's say, in this kitchen setting, you also want to estimate where the doors, the drawers are, and things like that. For that, we use a technique that my student Tanner Schmidt introduced a while ago. It's called DART, Dense Articulated Real-Time Tracking. And the idea here is that if you have a 3D shape model of an articulated object, could be a robot, a manipulator, could also be furniture, or things like that, then um, it's a very fast, again, GPU-based implementation of if you have a depth-based observation of a scene, you can then match your depth information against the model and estimate the articulation. Okay? So here the problem is that the estimation is not just, let's say, a 60 pose of a hand, but we also need to estimate the joints of the hand as well. Okay? And the nice thing is, in this case, since it's just purely model-based, it's very general, so it can be applied to any of these settings. Okay, so you can see the tracked model alongside with the point cloud, and we've done it also for some robot manipulation tasks at that time already. Okay. The key limitation is it needs to be initialized, right, because the search space is too high dimensional, and also that it's reasonably brittle, which means if, for example, your model doesn't match well, if you don't have a correct model, then the tracking might fail, or if tracking fails, reinitialization is also not uh, that easy. So actually, nowadays, of course, also, uh, you can do, for, for many of these tasks, you can do it, of course, through just deep learning, if you have enough training data. Okay? But once we have that framework now, we can kind of apply to the whole kitchen, where what you see here is, kind of this fuzzy stuff is going to be the point cloud that we see from the depth camera data. And um, the coloring indicates what object the different points are associated with. And what we can do is we can use the technique that I just told you to get the initial pose of objects. And here we take just the most likely orientation. And then we can use this to initialize Dart. So we're running Dart to track these individual objects. And we're running Dart to track also where the robot is in the scene and also to track um, the status of the furniture, kind of, of the cabinets. So you'll see here on the upper, it's, I, it might not be perfectly time synced, but you can see the robot now moving in. And we're using now the DART estimates to tell the manipulator where it should move in order to pick up the object. Yeah, this one is a bit lagging behind, sorry. And again, this only works, of course, if you have a good model of, of that scene, right? But we can do all of this now fully autonomously. Uh, and now, and one problem was, for example, with this initial system is if the depth camera is too far away, you're not going to get the object pose actually accurately enough so that you can really always grab it. Um, so now what we have is we have a depth camera also on the, on the wrist of the arm, and then you get a more accurate pose estimate for the object that you actually want to pick up. Okay? But the nice thing is we can do all this tracking in a single joint optimization over all the poses of these objects and the robot. And also um, you can incorporate physical constraints into that estimation problem, such as, for example, objects shouldn't interpenetrate and things like that. Okay. So the final piece to the puzzle here is then uh, the manipulator control. And for that, we're using a technique that Nathan Ratliff introduced. It's called these Riemannian motion policies, where the problem is that, let's say, if you have a rough trajectory of how the robot arm should move, then you, you, what you need to generate at a very high frequency, you need to generate control commands for the manipulator. And of course, there's been one of the, some of the most fundamental work has happened here, also with, especially with, with Osama Khatib's lab. Um, and, and the idea is that um, you want to do reasoning actually in the task space, in the geometric space that is going on here, but you need to generate control commands for the motors, for the joints of the robot. Okay? So how this approach here is working uh, is you can define, you define points, for example, on the robot. Just give you some examples, okay? And for these points, um, you can now define, or you can 
compute, for example, features in the environment such as what is the closest obstacle to that point or multiple of them. You can also define, for example, for this one, for the gripper, you can define, for example, what is the direction of the goal point where you want the, the end effector to actually go in the workspace. Yeah. And what it gives you is for each of these points, depending on, for example, the proximity of these obstacles and things like that, it's going to give you a desired acceleration where that point would like to move. And these accelerations can also take into account the, the velocity. So, for example, when you're moving along an obstacle, that it will not penalize that. So it will kind of allow you to smoothly move along obstacles. And then once you have defined all of these, then you can combine them all together and compute the accelerations of then actually in the controls, in the joint space of the robot. Okay, so you define things in the operational space and then you pull them back into the joint space. And here's just an example. Kind of, this is a robot that doesn't like open drawers. And this is Nathan in the background. And what we're doing here is we're using Dart to track the status of the cabinet, right? And then the robot, as you can see, can generate these pretty nice, smooth uh, motions. Important uh, thing to mention is, of course, that these RMPs, it's still a local technique, right? It's still kind of just mapping from the current state the velocities to uh, acceleration. So you still have to kind of have on top of that a global trajectory optimizer or a path planner. Um, here's another example now, uh, all of this put together. This is work that, that Chris Paxton did. Um, how you now, let's assume if you do higher level planning and you want your robot to execute such a plan, um, then uh, one technique that people are using is called these behavior trees. Um, which are kind of just observing the current state and then based on that they're generating what kind of uh, discrete mode, for example, the system should be in. And um, Chris developed these uh, logical dynamical systems that then, for example, in this case, let's assume the robot wants to put the spam into the drawer. And then it's pretty robust to these kind of perturbances, right? So it's constantly just kind of checking the state of the system, of the environment, and then sees if, for example, preconditions for certain actions are still fulfilled. So it pretty smoothly and quickly, right, can react to all of that. And we can later on, of course, we can have a discussion on the like you, you could now argue you can do all of this in end-to-end -end way, but I think the advantage of the model-based techniques is really that you can now really put on top of this a really long-term task and motion planner, right? That is very general. It can, uh, it can generate these, um, these behaviors. Let me just give you one more example. This is a project that Kalen Garrett, he's a student at MIT with Leslie Kelpling and Thomas Lozano Press working on task and motion planning, which is exactly this higher level reasoning. And actually most of the work that you see these days is still happening purely in simulation, which means that task and motion planning is they generate these scenarios and then they evaluate how fast they can do the planning in these scenarios. But often they don't really work in the real world yet because the perception isn't good enough. But now with having a system here that has pretty good perception, we can actually start running these task and motion planning systems in the real world. So in this case, the task is, and the focus of that paper is also on dealing with, with uh, uncertainty or not knowing certain things. So in this case, the robot knows that there's, I think it's a spam again. Yes, spam again. is in one of the two top drawers and it should figure out in which one and then put it in the other one. Okay, and in this case, the motion is actually he didn't use the RMPs, um, but the the full perception system that we have. So you can reason about okay, so it's got to be in the upper drawer, and then detects it in the upper drawer, and then you can do all the kind of planning with again the preconditions and all of that. So you can specify these tasks at a very high level of abstraction, and the planner figures out the rest, and then we can execute it now actually in the real world. Okay, and we're currently putting all the pieces together so that we can also do some longer term uh, benchmarking of that system. So you could imagine if you run this on whatever hundreds of tasks for many hours, how often is it going to fail? Because I'm sure it's going to fail once in a while. 
And the question, what are these failure cases, right? So far, the failure cases that we've seen when the cameras are just off-board is really if the pose estimation of these objects isn't accurate enough and things like that. And that brings me also now to the next point where um, actually the idea is can we get away with, um, without this explicit 60 pose estimation for manipulation tasks, okay? So, so far, again, we assume that we have 3D models of these objects and if you have that model and you can detect where it is, then you can also determine which grasp you want to use, for example. Um, but of course, ultimately, you want to be able to do all of this without object models, right? And I want to talk a bit about some of the more recent work we've done in, in that direction, um, getting over to grasp unknown objects. On the one hand side, of course, you want to um, use training data for uh, deep networks if you want to solve this problem with deep learning. And here we used um, the Flex Simulator, the NVIDIA system, um, where the idea is you have a, a model of an object and you can just sample thousands of possible grasps and then you run the simulator in order to evaluate whether that's a good grasp or not, right? And you can do this all in parallel on the GPU with, with, with many instances of these grasps and you can do this with many objects and then you do some pertur perturbations on it to figure out whether the grasp is actually also stable or robust to these perturbations. Okay, um, and then what you get is, for example, maybe for this object, you get some training data that tells you for that object, these are the 60 graphs that actually worked. Yeah, and you can do this now for whatever, thousands of objects. And um, in this specific piece of work that was published at ICCV with by Arsalan uh, last year, and I want to note the code and everything is available for that. If you want to look into this, is the idea is that, um, we train a deep network that looks at the point cloud of an object and then samples graphs that have a high chance of succeeding. Okay? How we do this is, let's assume you have an input image and we use the point cloud. What makes this problem a bit trickier than um, if you do it in the, in the simulated world is that we have occlusions and things like that, right? So we want to train a network to actually just observe the point cloud, so these, the backside of the object, for example, you can't even see. Okay, so now what we do with this is, we first have a deep network, and I'll go a bit into the detail of that. We have a deep network that takes that as input and samples grasps for it, okay? And since the grasp sampler is actually, uh, might make a mistake, because it's not trivial, we have another network that's kind of a, an evaluator or discriminator that takes as input a configuration of a sampled grasp and the object point cloud, so we're using point net plus plus for the, for the deep networks here, and it just is trained to um, predict whether that's going to be a successful grasp or not. Okay, so you can imagine this as being something that's cleaning up some of the sampled grasps and, and refines them. Okay, and we can also use this, as I said, for refinement where we say, um, actually the grasp evaluator, since it's a deep network, you can also propagate uh, backwards through the network to increase the probability of success with respect to the 60 pose of the gripper. And by iterating through this, you can actually move the gripper into a configuration that has a higher chance of succeeding. Yeah? Let me just go into the grass sampler here. And again, this is one of these order encoders, in this case, a conditional variational order encoder, where the idea is through the simulation, we get a successful grasp. Okay, and we encode this as the point cloud of the object along with the 60 gripper pose relative to the object. So it's all centered around the object coordinate frame, but as seen from the camera. So we don't know the internal coordinate frame of the object itself. Okay, and then we want to encode this into, in this case, a 2D latent space such that the 2D value along with the object model again can be decoded into the 6D grasp, okay? So the idea is we want to be able, in a sense, if that latent space was 6D, then of course you could just copy that value over, right? But the idea is we can actually compress the 6D grasp space into a 2D space if we condition it on the object point cloud, okay? And to train this, and, and then the decoder, of course, again, generates that uh, a grasp 
kind of reconstruction. And the loss is then just the difference between the position that the network generated versus the position you put in. Okay? And you train this again on many of these successful grasps. And the network then learns to go from, um, uh, wait, from the point cloud, yes, to, to, to kind of encode the 6D space into the 2D space. Okay? And then I'll tell you how we're going to use this. Now, once we have trained that latent space, we can then later on kind of throw, in this case, we throw away the encoder. In the previous work with this particle filtering, we threw away the decoder. Here we can throw away the encoder. Because later what we can do is we can then take a point cloud, sample a latent value, and the network is going to give us a 60 grasp for that. Okay. And we also actually have a more recent version that is working even better, that is just using actually the um, a GAN approach for that. Yeah, that's a GAN formulation um, that just came out last year. That works actually even better. But the idea is, is uh, the high level idea is very, very similar. It's just a more robust training for this embedding space. Okay, so here's what this might look like then, for example. Here's this bowl. And what uh, Arslan did here, if you move through this 2D latent space, then these are grasps that the network would sample conditioned on the latent value. Okay? And if you, for example, choose a different trajectory, let's say through that space, you're getting kind of this wrapping around uh, the rim of the bowl. And since we train it on different objects, different object types, the same latent space can be used on different objects. And then, for example, in this case, this would be an area where it's trying to generate grasp around the handle. So this is the grasp sampler. And then to clean up these grasps, again, we have another network that takes this input, uh, the point cloud of the object, along with a point cloud representing the gripper relative to the object. Okay, And then it's a point network plus plus, plus that's just trained to say whether that's going to be successful or not. And we're using the same simulated training data for that. So essentially what it does is, if you look at this, would be an example, for example, as input to the network. And then the score would be 0.13. And again, you can now propagate that through the network uh, with respect to the pose of the grippers so that you can increase the score. And you can do this iteratively. Right, where then the network generates a grass that has a higher chance of success. Make sense? And then we can put this all together, and here's just some results. That was at the time of the ICCV submission, we had 88% grass success rate. This is actually 88% um, on the very first attempt, right? Which means, of course, if you allow it to regrass, then we're getting much closer to 100. And these were objects that were not, uh, first of all, it was only trained in simulation. And the models of these objects were not in the training data. Right? And now the most recent version, actually, we trained a new network, which is a single network that we trained on more than 8,000 objects and uh, more than 200 ShapeNet classes. So it's a very general uh, uh, network. So it's not focused on a single object type or so. You can also actually train it on a specific object type, but then, uh, of course, it doesn't generalize as well. Okay. One extension to that is now, well, let me see if the timing works, uh, to cluttered scene. It's something that's going to come up at, uh, at Ikra, where the idea is, imagine you have this scene. So far, we assume that we have only the single object, okay, the point cloud of this object. But if you have a more cluttered scene, then what we can do is we had a paper at call last year where you can segment the scene, using, even if the objects are not known. So unknown object instant segmentation. And let's assume someone tells you, hey, pick up object number three. It doesn't matter which class. We can now, of course, first of all, we can kind of cut out that part around that object from the scene. which is this kind of red rectangle here. And now we can take this crop point cloud. First, we can segment out. In this case, it's the mustard. 
we can segment that mustard out and can feed that into the grass net to generate good grass for it. And then we have another net work, another network, the collision net that's now going to look at these graphs and predict which of those are going to be in collision or not. Okay, now you might say that you don't need this collision net because you just do collision checks on your point cloud, but it turns out that that is actually much better at detecting collisions with um, occluded areas, right? Because that was also trained on these full object models, so it learned to kind of predict collisions even if you don't see um, it in the point cloud. Yeah, so it's significantly better than just using the raw observation data. And once you have that, you can now, of course, choose graphs that are not in collision with anything and um, have a much higher chance of succeeding, even in clutter. So here's an example situation where, let's say, this is the outside view on the robot. This is the view from the robot's wrist camera. And I think we want to pick up, in this case, the, the white mug. And we do the segmentation. That's the goal. We do the segmentation of the scene, and then we can check which of these are mostly contributing to the collision um, of the grass that we want to execute. In this case, it would pick the one that was mostly contributing to this, and then it can just do grass planning on that object, and it can get this out of the way, and then does the same check on the scene again, and now it can say, okay, I can actually pick up the, the white cup, do another segmentation round, and you can pick it up. Okay, so now we can start even without having any object model in there, right? No 3D model of existing objects or reasoning or 6D pose. We can really do start doing more and more complex actually manipulation ta uh, tasks in this setting. Okay, and you can also imagine that you can use a very similar approach to do placement, right? Where kind of placement is very related to the grasping problem, right? Where you would say, I have a point cloud that I'm observing, and you can now start sampling um, stable placements for an object on a surface. And you can now, then you can actually do the full kind of grass planning where you reason about picking an object up and putting it on another stable position, all, all without um, using any 60, 60 object poses or so. And also, um, what Asa is looking at right now, doing this also with visual feedback in real time. Um, I want to just briefly say something about uh, the role of simulation. Um, I think, of course, for simulation is going to be um, a really, really big plus for robotics, right? I think uh, these simulators are nowadays are becoming more and more realistic, both on the physics side, but also on the photorealistic rendering side. And training robots in, in simulation is going to be very powerful just to save time, make it also more safe and um, and uh, clearly more efficient. And in simulation, you can provide much more details on the training data than if you would do it just in the real world, where you often don't have access to the internal state, for example, of the objects. So one example here is, of course, how we're training um, most of our uh, visual detection systems is just in simulation, where you can just place your objects into a scene, and you can randomize over the lighting conditions. And let me see if this video wants to play what oh, it actually wants to, right? Ah, yeah. Oh. Huh. Interesting, huh? Okay. Now it's playing again. No, it's not. You get the idea. So you can, the good thing, you can put these objects, there's also a scene where, where you can put the objects into drawers and things like that so that you can simulate more realistic viewpoints if the objects are in cluttered scenes. Uh, there's a lot of, of course, like randomizing the colors and things like that so that your detectors become robust. Um, I would like to be able to say that we solve this problem now, which means we can train everything purely in simulation. It's going to work right away perfectly well in the real world. Um, we have not figured it out yet so that it's really working as well as if you would add uh, some additional real-world data to it. And uh, I haven't seen any techniques that really perfectly transfer from the simulated to the real world, even on the perception side. Okay, so um, what, uh, we have a paper coming up at ICRA where the robot then collects uh, a small amount of additional training data for 
the, for example, for the detection networks, and that improves the results then still over just doing it in simulation. And the same, of course, for control, where um, we can now train robots and policies in simulated environments. And there, again, similar, these ideas with domain randomization, where in this case, you might not know how long that rope is, or you might not know the mass and the size of that little cylinder that you want to put in there. Um, you can randomize over that and, and train policies for this. This is work that Yevgen Chebotar did. And Fabio Ramos is now working on a technique that's called BASIM, where the idea is we do most of the training in the, re in, in the simulation, and then we go into the real world, do a small number of rollouts in order to hopefully refine the simulation, and then get away with training something that works well in the real world, but only requires a minimum amount of real world experience, let's say. Okay, and we, we, we see a lot of work in this direction going on in general, right? But uh, what this work by Fabio Ramos was at RSS last year does is really phrase this as a, as a Bayesian estimation problem where you have a simulator that has certain parameters. You treat the simulator as a black box, but it has certain parameters and you generate many rollouts. And with that, you learn an invertible model that goes from statistics over these rollouts back to distributions over likelihood over the parameters. And then you can update them over time and refine your sampling distributions using the real world rollouts. Okay, um, so I think simulation is gonna be really useful for perception, for control, but also just for testing your whole robot system. So here's an example of our robot in the real kitchen and one of them is actually a simulated version of that kitchen. So we worked with the NVIDIA, the content creation team that uh, generated a pretty nice realistic simulation of the kitchen. I'm sure by now most of you have seen which one is which, but uh, I'm sure a little bit more work might have made it even more similar, but it's not trivial to see anymore, right? Um, so that kind of hints at what is possible with these kind of simulators, right? Also on the photorealistic rendering side, okay? So the goal would be that you can actually run your robot control system against the, si against the simulator, and as we know, there might be, sometimes you might have to do some debugging and things like that, right? So you can, do this against the simulator if the simulation is realistic enough. And it's still actually a major effort to develop a, a photorealistic and especially also a physically realistic simulation of such an environment. So how to do content creation for these kind of settings is also one of the big open questions. All right, I'm coming to my last slide here mainly and I think we've seen huge, huge progress, especially also thanks to, to deep learning on the perception side on individual components. And what I talked about today is kind of this attempt of bringing these different pieces together so that we can solve kind of larger scale problems, right? That go all the way from the low level control to the high level task planning and all the perception. Uh, and I think um, th th it will be really useful to move more towards these systems because often by doing that, you really learn about what's working, what's not working. And uh, for that, you really need to integrate these different components. And I think as a robotics community, we need to start thinking more about benchmarking environments in which we can uh, really test our different algorithms against each other, not only on, let's say, simple tasks like just picking up an object, but much more in the context of larger scale tasks. I think being in the NVIDIA auditorium, of course, NVIDIA is super well suited, I think, for really driving a lot of the progress in robotics, right? On the one hand side, it's clearly, of course, GPU acceleration for, for deep learning and inference, perception. These robots will need more and more perception and learning. So it's, that's, a, that's a clear case. But also, I think the simulation, NVIDIA has, of course, a lot of experience uh, on physics-based simulation, photorealistic rendering from gaming and computer graphics. And I think that's gonna be really important moving all of this forward. Uh, Various open questions, I think. One interesting question that really keeps on coming up is how do we represent these environments? You saw today there's one, the first part was more about really explicit representations of the world, right? Explicit shape models, explicit reasoning about things like 6D pose and everything. And an alternative is more like the second part that I described, which is more implicit, right? Like this 6D grasp net that generates grasp of an object. On the one hand side, you might say, the network has no idea of what it's doing, but obviously if it can generate good grasp for different objects, it must implicitly have these kind of reasoning capabilities, right? And the question is, 
where on the long run should we be on, on that, right? Like how much 3D knowledge, for example, should we inject into the deep networks in order to do the learning better? And I think um, clearly uh, we've seen some also nice recent work on 3D voxel-based representations that are not explicitly recovering 3D shape, but um, just recover kind of a 3D uh, feature space that is then well suited for certain tasks like um, matching objects into a scene and things like that. So I think there's, this is uh, really one of the big questions that, uh, yeah, that I'd be happy to discuss some more. Also the same, of course, on the control side, right? We need to learn representations, obviously, that are not just good for a specific task, um, or a labeling task, but they have to be good in the context of a control task. And of course, like the work that Chelsea is doing here is, is also a really interesting direction in this, in this uh, really interesting work in this direction. Of course, simulation, um, how close are we? There's still many different components that I think are still missing there, right? How do we do sim to real better? Content creation is gonna be a big problem if we wanna train our robots in thousands of environments, they have to look pretty good. So who's gonna do this for us? Of course, the furniture uh, manufacturers, they often have 3D models. If they would be willing to share with us all these models, I think that would be really cool. Touch sensing is a really big, uh, area still on the one hand side on the hardware itself right and I saw some exciting work today kind of building better touch sensors but also then how to take advantage of it because it could should clearly be uh, connected to this and again I think benchmarking is going to be a big question um, moving forward so with that thank you very much also this is the lab and of course many of the great interns we've been working with, uh, again, several of them here. If I have one more minute, I can just show you one thing that I didn't talk about is like something like this, just to show you that we're not only doing kitchen kind of stuff, but this is work that Anko Hande has done on the Dex pile that's gonna be at ICRA, where the idea is he built uh, with multiple depth cameras a, a hand tracking system, and then they can in real time, well, one sixth of real time here. I wanna be really open about this. Um, but you can actually get the robot to do pretty cool stuff. So the idea is that he's standing next to the robot and he's kind of moving the hand that then in real time gets, first you track it, but uh, you cannot just copy the joints over, but you have to, because the shape of the Allegro hand is different, so you have to do some re-matching re, uh, to that, but then you can actually get this hand to do pretty cool things, right? That, uh, in a fully automated way is just not possible yet. And you can use this then moving forward maybe also for imitation learning and things like that. And of course, touch sensing, yeah, we've done a good bunch of touch sensing work using the biotech sensors here to pick up objects, but also just to learn kind of models of these touch sensors, right? So that you can go from the, in this case, electron measurements to um, contact points and contact directions and things like that. All right, with that, uh, I'll thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the last point you made. How much is this useful Because if I am as a you we pick up the car, I will mostly rely on my touch information, but if you turn around the car, understand what it is and then grasp it rather than size. So if I were to choose between my eyesight and my touch, I would rather rely on the touch, so what's... I think it's, it's a combination of both you really want to use. And I think that's also what, what we do, right? Like for example, the visual perception gives me clearly, um, first of all, it tells me where I have to put my, move my hand in order to grasp it. And it also gives me a pretty good prior on where I should grab it. But then of course, at some point, clearly it's touch that takes over. Right, so I can clearly then close my eyes and I can do all of these things. So I think it's not either or, it's a combination of those, clearly. How far are we with the touch? How much can we still improve on the touch side? Oh, a, a lot, a lot. And there's also Jeanette and many people are doing some really cool work in that domain. Um, I think as you've seen, we, we were able to, we're also moving in this direction, but it's clearly not solved yet. And again, one of the problems is also we just don't have robot hands that have touch sensing all on the palm and everything. We're still kind of stuck to kind of fingertip kind of uh, sensing on that side. And then again, uh, I think a lot of the work that we are seeing is kind of um, still pretty isolated where it's about like learning a predictive model of 
kind of what happens if I rotate my finger and things like that, or slip detection. But I, I haven't really seen a lot of work so that you can really feel like, yeah, this is working for arbitrary objects or things like that. Or, and in hand manipulation is also a hard problem. So a lot of work to be done in that area. Yeah. Oh, was one more? Yeah, I'm wondering if you have any insights about problems where you need to manipulate an object that is not only cluttered in a cluttered environment, but you also need to remove some objects around it to grasp it. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a I mean, much more complex problem than just grasping an object. Yeah, that's an interesting. So actually, with the one video I showed that was actually exactly that case. Wait, this one here. So where, oh, let me see. Now it should play. Yeah, where we actually want to grab the white coffee cup, right? And we can segment the scene, and then we can reason about these other segments, and we can reason about how much are they in the way of being able to grasp it. And I think actually, so on the one hand side, what you could do is you could do now the full complex planning where you say exactly in which order do I need to pick which object in order to grab then this one, and what might be the optimal ordering. I think for many of these scenes, reasonably simple heuristics might actually work pretty well. And I'm pretty sure that I'm using very simple heuristics where you just say, OK, here are the objects. And you say, well, I can't grab it now. This looks like it's in the way. So what you're doing then, you just grab it and get it out of the way. And then you look again and you say, hmm, OK, there's another one in the way, right? So kind of simple heuristics where you just say, take them away, kind of one after the other might get us actually pretty far already. And of course, then, the idea would be that these heuristics, you can train um, in, in very large uh, simulation so that the deep networks, for example, can encode these heuristics well. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we need really very complicated all the rearrangement planning for that. We can do it often. Yeah. Um, so beyond, so like you're using depth sensors that are not located on the robot itself, as well as the depth sensor on the robot. Do you think that that's something that, like, going into the future, will all the sensors eventually be located on the robot? And also, are there other sensors that could aid in perception that you would, like, ideally want to have that, you know, maybe today aren't quite the technology to Yeah, I think on the one hand side, you could also imagine a combination, but clearly, for example, for the um, home setting, where you don't want to put depth cameras everywhere. Or if, if, for example, if you want to get an object out of a drawer, then clearly it's good to have a camera on the robot so that it can actually look in, in through the drawer. We also carry our cameras with us. It turns out, actually, it's tricky where to place them, right? If you have, of course, on the gripper is one. But if you want to have something closer to, let's say, a human head position on a robot on a mobile base, they're, it's actually pretty terrible because you have this fixed viewpoint and sometimes you want to be able kind of to lean over and look into something. So it's very difficult actually to where to best place these cameras. Um, in industrial settings you can imagine also putting more like cameras outside because the industrial robots, um, they don't have any, any perception right now on them. Um, which touch I think is I think the one I would love most. Having much better like touch skin on these robots, not only on the fingers, but also on the arms and everywhere, right? And people are looking at that, but it's still, I don't think it's ready for prime time yet. That would be my dream sensor. All right, so let's thank the camera speaker. Thank you.